Thank you for downloading and subscribing to our podcast. The Bible closes with the encouragement that our Lord Jesus will come quickly. The Apostle John then proceeds to pray that our Lord Jesus would come quickly by saying, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. However, what do we do in light of what appears to us to be a very long delay? How do we conduct ourselves when it seems that this promise is not working out the way we desire it to manifest itself? How do we wait patiently for Christ's arrival? If you ever ask these questions, please join us as we preach through the book of Thessalonians. When we talk about death and we think about death, there's many ways that people deal with death. We can think about maybe uh, people believe you just cease to exist. So this life is lived to the fullness and whatever you accomplish in your 80 whatever amount of years under the sun, that's what you accomplish and then you just cease to exist. Some may believe that you can visit the people from the dead if you get the right person to conjure up those who are dead that they may be able to, to get them from their secret place. Uh, Others may believe that you become some sort of another creature or your spirit gets absorbed into something else. So the reality is we, we find in terms of humanity, death is something we have to cope with. Uh, it's something that is ever before us. Uh, we are conscious of our mortality. As we proceed in our years, we recognize more and more as the decades turn uh, that our bodies are not what they once were. Uh, we experience the pain of the common curse, and we are confronted with our mortality. So in terms of that, we may think, well, this is, again, our problem, and I marvel at what Thessalonians is telling us. Uh, Paul is actually writing about this very issue to the church. As they're confronted with the mortality of those who have died, uh, who are in the Lord, and it seems there's a bit of a concern. How do we cope with this? Well, what do we do with this? What How do we view those who have died in the Lord? What what is the hope we can take from it? And so really, as as we ask this question, it's how does one cope with death as a Christian? Do we just laugh at it? Do we just say, well, it's not really anything that's that severe? Uh, Do we grieve X amount of days and say that this is the way it has to be? I mean, how do we cope with this? So as we look at this, we'll see first, how do we grieve? And secondly, why have hope? So as the Apostle Paul then starts with how do we grieve, or he addresses this issue. Uh, we look at the reminder from verses 11 and 12 as the Apostle Paul writes to this church. And again, that's why I wanted to put it into context, that we can't just see verses 13 and 18 as just standing on their own and that it doesn't fit in anywhere. That the Apostle Paul is driving home that we live our lives before the world. And as we live our lives before the world, we may say, well, this should make us an ambitious people. Remember when he talked about living this peaceful and quiet life, just working with your hands. That the Apostle Paul is, is exhorting us to basically have an ambition to have no ambition, which we pointed out last week is a little bit of a contradiction. How can your ambition be not to have ambition? But the point that Paul's making is simply this. Find our contentment in being ordinary. Find our contentment in knowing that we are set apart in Christ, we are his redeemed, uh, we live for his glory, and whatever the Lord may put in our path, however we live this out, we seek to do this for his honor and glory. Whether it's suffering, whether it's blessing, whatever it may be, we're resting in his providential care all along the way. And so that's an important thing to put in the backdrop of this, because now it Paul's dealing with that issue, well then how big is God's providential care, right? I mean, I can understand that as I live, God can order my steps or order your steps as we go about our life, but what about in death? Uh, Where does God's providence function in terms of that? And so this is what Paul's dealing with now. Because when we ask that question of, you know, how do we cope with death? How do I live my life to the fullest, if you will, even if we ask this in a Christian sense? Well, what does that mean? Well, living life in the fullest, according to the Apostle Paul prior to this, means you live your life for the glory of Christ, no matter how ordinary that may look uh, to the common man. We find our contentment in the Lord. 
That's living life to the fullest. Now, again, that's contrary to the world. The world says you live life for yourself and make sure you establish yourself as being significant. Christianity is saying, no, live your life for the glory of your God. Seek the face of your Lord. So now going on with this issue is how Paul reminds these brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. And so he's writing to the brothers. He's giving them some insight. And it's important to understand he addresses them as brothers. He doesn't say apostate ones. He doesn't say uh, those who are struggling, and if you're struggling, then therefore you're not in Christ. But he addresses them as brothers. He says, listen, I understand you have this tension where you're asking the question, what do we do with those who are part of our church and they died? How do we view them? Are they lost? You know, you get mystery religions where, you know, you believe that there's some sort of a spiritual essence of the person that goes somewhere, but you don't really know where they go. Uh, it's sort of a pre-Gnostic view that, you know, you shed the, the outward shell and you go to a better place potentially, but you don't really know. It's some mystery that, that lies beyond the human consciousness. And so it seems this is what they're struggling with. And as Paul writes this, he, he writes them uh, to make sure they understand that, A, these people aren't just ceasing to be. B, they're not just going to some mysterious place. Even as we find in Corinth, as the Apostle Paul pushes them in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, some are being baptized on behalf of the dead. Now, this isn't Paul uh, saying this practice is good. It's Paul calling to their attention, see, you do believe there is something beyond this world. Now understand, there's a physical, bodily resurrection that happens. That's what Paul is addressing here to the Thessalonian church. And again, it's, it's rather remarkable that we can say, well, we're so advanced and, and we move beyond this simplistic Christian system. And here you have these Christians struggling with the same issue. How do I deal with death? How can I be assured that my God really is sovereign even over death itself? Notice then as Paul addresses this as we understand the struggle in this context. Verse 14, he gives the assurance that the Lord will bring those who have fallen asleep. Verse 15, the appearance of parousia, uh, the visible returning of Christ, the peeling back of the curtains, literally. Verses 16 through 18, the very public re revelation of Christ and the manifestation of Christ. So it's not so much a question of whether or not there is life after this life for the Thessalonian church, at least that's what it seems. It seems they believe there's some sort of a life. It's just a definition of, is there a life under the care of Christ, or is this a life that's something else? And so that's, that's the burning question that seems to be going in this church. And it seems that it's a big enough question as Paul writes this section and goes on in chapter 5, basically 1 through 11, continuing this discussion, that's a pretty big thing going on in the church, that people really are troubled by this reality. And so when people have died, it seems they're saying, well, will we see them again? Are they going to miss out on this uh, advent of Christ when he returns? Are they going to be in heaven when they have the fullness of heaven? Or is it better to be alive when Christ returns? Uh, because then when Christ returns, we get the fullness of heaven and they miss out. And so it seems that's really the issue that Paul's dealing with. Now again, when Paul writes this and he mentions uh, about those who have fallen asleep, uh, sometimes we can read that and we can say, well, is the Apostle Paul promoting some sort of a soul sleep in the sense that you die and then you just kind of sleep in the grave and then at the resurrection you're, you're raised up? Well, that's not Paul's intention. Uh, we can find other passages in Scripture, say, for example, Revelation 6, uh, where you have the peeling back of the scrolls, the peeling back of the altar, you have the saints who are there crying out to God, how long, O Lord? Then it certainly implies there is a consciousness as John is peering into heaven and has this vision and reporting to us what he sees in heaven, that the saints who, are, who have died have a consciousness of being in the presence of Christ. They have a consciousness of, of a progression of time, and they have a consciousness that there will be an end. So what we say from this, in, in terms of making this as simple as possible, we say that as our body goes to the ground, our soul goes to begin to taste the bliss of whether it's eternal bliss or whether it's the, the horror of eternal um, torment. 
And so we begin to taste it, but we don't have the fullness of it. And the reason is because the new heavens, new earth, have not been created. So this is basically what, what we lay out in terms of what we believe with the end times. So now as Paul writes us and says those who have fallen asleep, why use that language? Paul doesn't want us to think that they just go to the grave and they lose consciousness. As I mentioned, there's evidence you can see even with Lazarus and the rich man in that parable. It's expected there's a consciousness uh, a beginning to taste the bliss of heaven or the torments. And so what, what Paul's dealing with when he says asleep, he wants the church to understand death has no hold on us. As we are in Christ, we have to believe death has no hold on us. That's the premise we move forward with. So when we face and are confronted with our mortality, we can say, okay, I understand unless Christ comes again, there is a very high probability that I am going to die at some point. And I don't need to be afraid of this because God in his providential care has disarmed the very pain and terror and torment of what death is. I may experience the pain of whatever it is that leads to my death, but the reality is, at the end of it, I can be assured that God, by his providential care, is guiding me every step of the way through that suffering, as he does with all his people, not just with me in some unique way. This is a promise that Paul's laying out for all of us. And so as Paul writes us and he says asleep, he wants us to understand this death is not something where this church should be looking at the death of the loved ones and say, oh my goodness, I will never see this person again. Uh, is this person in some afterlife? Do I need to go to some sort of an enchanter? Do I need to, to talk to them and contact them and see how they're doing? Paul's saying, take a break, take a breath, understand. God is so sovereign that in his providence, he is able to see his people even through this moment of death. And so we, we get an understanding of this in terms of what Paul goes on, because Paul tells us we are those who do not grieve without hope, that we are those who have assurance. And you may say, well, well why is that? Well, one of the things he tells us in terms of the, the proof of this is that Jesus has died and Jesus has been raised to life. And we may say, well, how does that give us hope? Because Jesus dying and Jesus being raised to life, those are future events. That's a future reality. That's, that's something that's way down the, the line. Or maybe in this church it seems it's going to be tomorrow, at least in their view, that, that this is going to impact us. But what Paul wants us to understand is that the death of Christ and resurrection of Christ is so essential to understand. In Genesis 3.15, what does the Lord promise? The seed of the woman will trample the head of the serpent. And as the seed of the woman tramples the head of the serpent, this means that the promise of redemption is done. Now remember the serpent uh, reaches up or rears up and, and bites the heel of the, the champion, which means the champion is going to taste the sting of death. And so the Apostle Paul is reminding the church, listen, Christ's death validates that promise. Genesis 15 when Abram was standing before that blood path in the deep darkness, remember that imagery in Genesis 15, the deep darkness, the hell darkness, the darkness associated with the day of the Lord, overwhelms Abram. Uh, the Lord's going to tell me to walk. I'm going to be like these animals. Who passes between the pieces of animals? But God himself, meaning that the Lord is the one who will take that sanction of death and die. Isaiah 53 where we have the one who dies, who is beaten, a suffering servant, who takes our iniquity upon him. And where does Isaiah 53 end? Remember the end of Isaiah 53, the servant song? He lives to make intercession for his people. And so what Paul's driving home is, yes, Christ has died. And in that death, he has confirmed the redemptive promises of God. They are yes and amen. They cannot be taken back. They are grounded and certain in history. Now Christ has also been raised from the dead. And it's the Old Testament promising. He lives to make intercession for his people. So we shouldn't see Christ sitting in heaven, staring at the wall, waiting for when he's supposed to return, because that's his next step in the process. 
But rather, Isaiah 53 is telling us Christ is praying on our behalf. We have the great high priest in heaven itself praying for us, desiring for us to enter into glory. This is why the Apostle Paul offers a proof in saying, listen, Christ has died, Christ has been raised. The promise of the gospel is yes and amen in him. He has validated the word of the Lord. He has been raised to life. This is why death is merely sleeping. We do not lose all hope in the midst of suffering. We know that our Lord is the one who has overcome. And as he has overcome, we have life. And we have it definitively in him, even in the midst of our struggle, even in the midst of our pain, even in the midst of our grief. And so we understand then, as the Apostle Paul writes, that we do not live as pagans wondering what happens to the dead. We do not wonder if Christ is really sovereign enough to overcome that. Paul is answering that right there in verse 14. Christ is the one who has been raised up. He brings life. So then we have that exhortation not to grieve as those who have no hope. So why do we have hope? What is the hope? Because the reality is, if we've experienced the death of a loved one, we know the pain. We know the grief. We know the sorrow. We know the questions. And so the reality is then, how do we have hope in the midst of this? Well, this is what the Apostle Paul wants us to understand. That he wants us to understand that those who have died in the Lord are those who are coming back with the Lord. He has protected them. He has preserved them. Uh, those who have died have been, will be raised, and they will return with the Lord himself. And so simply, we understand that as the Lord returns with the parousia, this just means that visible uh, return of a king or a presentation of a king uh, where all of a sudden he wasn't there and then he is there. That's all that it implies. It's basically the picture of what we can think of in Genesis when the Lord places a firmament over the earth. He dwells above the firmament. As he dwells above the firmament, the coming of Christ peels away that canopy, opens the sky for all eyes to see. So this is the glorious arrival of Christ. Now in terms of what Paul has already mentioned in terms of this arrival of Christ, it's not just here uh, in these verses that we're looking at this morning. He tells us in 2 verse 19, Paul's living his life in light of the final judgment of Christ. That is, his eyes, his focus is oriented to heaven. As he mentions, even this church is part of his boasting in the sense of, Lord, look at what you have done. Look at how you have used me as an agent. It's not Paul propping himself up, but again, it's God celebrating how God has used his people in his particular times. 3 verse 13, the establishment of their hearts is in Christ, our God, our Father. It is God who finishes what he has started. Uh, that his return is coming. Uh, it's a reality that the Lord will uh, preserve us as we sojourn under the sun. 5 verse 23, the blessing and the wish that the Lord would sustain. So remember what we said from the canons of Dort uh, through this. We're called to persevere in the sense that that's our consciousness. We look upon the Lord, but why do we persevere? We persevere because of the Lord's preserving power. And that's what Paul's going back and forth with in Thessalonians. We have our doubts. What do we cling to? The promise of the gospel. Christ has died. Christ has been raised. We have new life. When we are overconfident, what do we remind ourselves? The gospel. Christ had to die. Christ had to be raised to make us worthy. It's not because we've done something to make ourselves worthy. And so in terms of what Paul is saying here to the Thessalonian at this point, is he wants us to understand that the Lord will preserve this church. And if we're those who grieve without hope, we're basically saying that there is no hope, there is no reunion, there is no resurrection, there is no heaven, there is no overcoming of death itself. And so the Apostle Paul is not saying that it's, it's immoral or sinful for us to grieve, because the reality is, if we don't grieve the loss of a loved one, we're saying to God, well, the sting of the common curse, well, that's really not that bad, and we're kind of shaking our fists at God. The reality is, it's a consequence of sin. Death hurts. 
death is a consequence of rebellion. And so the reality is, yes, we, we can grieve and we can work through it. The difference is we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve with our hope and our confidence in Christ. We grieve the loss of a loved one, but we understand that our Lord is still faithful. Our Lord is still merciful, and his providence extends uh, beyond this here and now and beyond our lives into even death itself. So the, the call for us then, as we live this out, is to seek to look to the face of God, knowing the peace of the gospel. And so as, as Paul lays out this timing then and, and what this looks like, because again, we, we may think, well, did I miss it? Uh, are we in the, the end times? Is, is this it? How do I know when the end times really happens? Well, this is what we find in terms of that final and definitive day. In terms of this definitive day, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we who are alive will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So what this means is those who are alive when Christ comes again, this is why you say there's a high probability we're going to taste death, in the sense that the only way we're not going to taste death is if we're alive and Christ returns. That's what Paul is telling us in Thessalonians. Uh, that, that it is, uh, obviously, there are those who will be alive when Christ returns, and they will have the blessing of never experiencing uh, what death is like. Uh, they will be taken straight to heaven and, and receive their glorified bodies. But the Apostle Paul wants the church to understand that it's not that somehow those who are alive when Christ returns has a better experience than those who have died. In the sense that those who are alive go to heaven, those who have died, well, maybe at some point they'll arrive in heaven. Paul's saying, no, we're, we're all going to begin that eternal bliss of the new heavens and the new earth together. Uh, this is a peace that we have. Uh, the Lord is the one who will bring them, the Lord will raise them, and we are those who will be brought uh, up to him, and we will hear the glory of us. So how do we know when this happens? Well, again, we'll get into more of the ordering, say, in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 5, but just briefly walking through what we find in these verses. That we find that uh, there is the event that is initiated with the, the sound of the trumpet or the cry of the command. Obviously, you can imagine there's debate about who is the archangel, what does the archangel mean, uh, which angel are they talking about. Well, the reality is it's a call of a trumpet, so see it as a trumpet sound, like the voice of a commander. So the imagery that the Apostle Paul wants us to have in mind is the sound of, of the bugle, giving the command to go to war. It's that command of rally the troops, time to get up, time to get ready. It's time for us to go to war. And so this, this call to go to war is really the voice of Christ. It's the call of Christ. And so his voice is like the voice of an archangel, as you can translate it that way as well, like the trumpet. And so he's using this analogy to understand that when Christ gives this call of saying enough is enough, this is a final day of reckoning, this is a day where I call my people home and I bring my judgment, it's not going to be something secret. Uh, everyone will hear it. It is a call of this. We find then that those who are in Christ will be raised, uh, those who are alive are caught up together. So what happens then is it seems that this picture is that those who are alive are brought up into heaven, or at least brought up as Christ is in heaven and come down in the sky with him. Uh, those who are dead receive their glorified body and, and once again their soul is reunited with their body. They're also brought up and we find that they all come down from the clouds in the glory of heaven. And that seems to be what Paul is saying. How this all works out, how this all manifests itself, he doesn't tell us all the mechanics, but it's not really for us to know. What the Apostle Paul fundamentally wants us to understand is that when Christ gives his call, like in John 5, 25 through 29, the call of the Son of God, or the call of the Son of Man at the final judgment, is that call that's like the trumpet the trumpet we associate with that final judgment, or that coming into the presence of God, like Exodus 19. Uh, we have the fear of the assembled people, hearing the voice of God, like the trumpet, uh, the, the holiness of it all, the trumpet sounding, this, this theophany and presence of God. Isaiah 27, the same thing, the people are dispersed, 
the trumpet call, the people coming together, along with Joel 2, Zechariah 9. You can find this throughout the Old Testament. The point is, this is a calling of God, calling and rallying his people together. Now, in terms of how this all works out, again, we don't know the particulars. Christ comes, those who are dead are raised, they're caught up, as some say, the rapture, even though it's from the Latin, uh, it's actually not. Um, the, the rapture is just the raising up, the, the taking up is, is what the Greek word is getting at, and then those who come with Christ. Now, before Paul goes into all the details of this, notice that he takes a break before going into verse, uh, verses 1 through 11. This is where in verse 18 he says something that seems almost strange, that your, your interest is piqued, and you say, well, how does this final judgment work? What, what are you talking about? What do you mean? He says, therefore... Encourage one another with these things. And it's kind of this, this thing where Paul's sort of snapping us back to reality. And he wants the church to understand that this is an encouragement. And we may say, but I have so many questions. And the Apostle Paul is saying, don't worry. When Christ comes again, those questions will be answered. But the fundamental question that's plaguing the church is answered. What do we do with those who have died in the Lord? And the Apostle Paul is saying, don't worry. The Lord knows where they are, and the Lord will raise them up, and the Lord will bring them at the final day of glory, and he will unite them with the church that is living, and we will be united and glorified with the one Christ. That's the simple answer he wants us to understand. The encouragement is that we understand the gospel has been ratified in Christ Jesus. The sting and pain of death has been overcome. What Christ has done really does what God promised it to do. The sting of death, the sting of sin, the pain of the common curse is taken away. The promise of glory is ours. The assurance that we will dwell with the Lord in heaven is ours. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, don't go around grieving without hope. Yes, work through the process. Yes, experience uh, the, the pain of the loss of a loved one. But look forward to that glorious day of return. Look forward to having that glorious mindset where you see things in the celebration of who God is and in the joy of his mind of being perfectly aligned in that glorified day with the purpose of God, no longer experiencing the pain uh, or the suffering of sin itself or the consequences of it because Christ bore those consequences in the fullness. And so when the Apostle Paul tells us to encourage one another with this truth, this is encouraging. It's saying you have died to sin. You have, you have died to the common curse. You've been raised to life. This is a fundamental assurance, not just in terms of this life, but it guarantees our victory because Christ has overcome. And Christ is such a shepherd that he can lead us through the valley of the shadow of death, literally through death, and he can still have his hand on his people bringing us to the glorious day of that wonderful reunion that our Lord truly does live to make intercession for his people. So we return then to the question where we began. How does one cope with death as a Christian? Well, on the one hand, I, I don't think we minimize it. I don't think we minimize the reality that it hurts and that there's pain and that there's sorrow and that there's moments of grief. But where do we turn our mind? We turn our minds to the reality of what we have in Christ, the peace of our Lord, of knowing that our Lord is a gracious God and a gracious King, and that those who have died in the Lord certainly have life, and that there's no reason for us to wonder, is God able to control them? Is God able to oversee them? Is God able to lead them? Is God able to, to care for them? The reality is yes. Our Lord is a gracious God. He is such a shepherd that he can even shepherd us through the moments of death and bring us to the great glorious reunion, whether we are alive or whether we are dead at that moment. And so how does this ultimately then uh, encourage us? Well, we know that it is God who has secured us. God has acted. God has fulfilled his promises. And so as we have the first advent of Christ, where he has entered history, where he has died after living a perfect life, he has been raised to life, we can be assured when he says, I am coming again, we know that that first promise, all hope against hope, like we heard last evening with Abram struggling, oh, the Lord can't bring about the promise through me. We find the Lord did, in fact, bring the promise through him. 
So it is when you say there's no way Christ can come again that this is ever going to happen. We can be assured. I'm, I'm confident that it's even going to be more majestic than it sounds here. And the Apostle Paul knows that if we knew the fullness of it, we'd say there's no way that's going to happen. And so he presents it in a way we can understand. But I guarantee you, when Christ comes again, it will be a glorious day. The hope today is we know that Christ has conquered death. And we continue to proceed in that confidence, whether we experience the pain of the common curse, whether we're in the midst of suffering, we can be assured our Lord has overcome and our Lord is still caring for us by his providential care with his shepherding hand. Let us then proceed in that confidence and proceed in that hope. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.